Greetings, Metalheads. Thanks for watching part one of the Crimson Glory interview with Ben Jackson. You're going to watch part two now, so please leave comments at the end of it and please enjoy and share on social media. Thanks for watching, Metalheads. Well, then. So, so, Ben, we're going to talk about this Astronomica album. Um, as we know, mid, the Midnight left the band. Um, a good friend of mine, Wade Black, Black, came into the band. How did you find Wade? Um, well, I know that uh, John and Jeff around 1998 were, were thinking about bringing Crimson Glory back into existence, and they at first wanted to do it with Midnight. And so before reaching out to me, even they, they were talking to Mid and met with him a couple times to try to get the band going again with him. But for whatever reason, um, I think he he didn't uh, – didn't look like he was going to be up for the job or something. So they saw Wade somewhere. I think John, John and Jeff might've been out at a local club somewhere in the Tampa scene. And they saw Wade um, singing with his band, Lucian black. And they were, uh, they thought Wade was a badass. You know, he had a cool persona on stage, you know, really rocked with a lot of intensity and um, they saw something in Wade. They were like, why don't, why don't we talk to this guy? So, that's how that came about. So they sort of, you know, they they discovered Wade singing out one night and they started talking to Wade and then they, they got that whole album rolling. Um, and honestly, that that album was almost uh, almost completely finished before they even called me to rejoin the band. Right. OK. So, yeah. Was you was you kind of disappointed that you didn't we wasn't really involved with the album? Yeah, you know, a little bit. I would have liked to have been because, you know, obviously uh, they were bringing the band back and, and they were getting back to a lot of more twin guitar stuff and just more writing that was more, you know, in keeping with the Crimson Glory original feel and style. And uh, so I would have loved to play, you know, and written more on it and stuff, but it's OK. It's just how it worked out. You know, they reached out to me when the album was nearing completion and wanted to know if I wanted to do the European tour and tour with the band. And I said, yeah, you know, let's do it. So I came back and started rehearsing with, you know, Jeff and the, the guys. At first, we were going to use Steve Wackles actually on the tour and uh, from Sabotage. And we had a few rehearsals with uh, Jeff Lords and myself and Steve. We had a couple rehearsal where John didn't even make it. It was just everybody but John. And uh, whatever happened, that was fun playing with Steve because he's he's a rock and drummer too. And I, I was always kind of a fan, you know, Steve sabotage and fan as well as a friend, you know, and we know each other. Yeah. But for whatever reason, I think he, he had some scheduling things that wasn't really going to allow him to put a lot of time into it or something to – to learn everything. So we ended up getting another friend of ours, Jesse Rojas to do the drums on the tour. Right. So what do what did you think of the album in general? I mean, there's, I mean, it was, I mean, Wade's vocals are very high pitched compared to mid, well, different style to midnight. You know, he's very kind of more like King Diamond in places, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I liked the record when they played it for me, you know, the first time they it wasn't really finished. They were playing me some rough cuts. I liked it. You know, it had a lot of intensity. That's what I liked. You know, they, it was really like strong and very intense. Um, Wade's performance and as well as uh, Jeff's bass sound on the record was just really in your face and, you know, really cool the way they were mixing it. Very bass heavy. You know, you could hear all the twin guitar stuff, but you could still hear the bass more than even on the earlier Crimson albums. It was very like loud and in your face. I mean, there's Congrats. one song, one song, War of the World, just like, I think that's where Wade is singing at his highest. Yeah. Wade belted on that record, too. He really did a good job. You know, I think, you know, hats off to John on that, too. And I think because he really, like, you know, produced Wade and, and coached him through the album and, and tried to really bring the best out of him, you know, in a studio setting. And I think, you know, Wade did a really good job, but I think, a lot of it has to do with him being with the right people that were kind of bringing the best out of him, you know? Yeah, I mean, am I correct in saying, uh, without disrespecting yeah. the band, was the uh, drum machine on most of the albums? 
um yeah that album had a drum machine on it why did it have a drum machine because i know dana can play live why didn't he do the album what was the reason oh you're going back to transcendence well on the first album that's all real drums obviously yeah you know, second album you know i'm it, i'm not gonna lie the thing what happened is we we were playing a gig down in miami after we uh put out our first album we were doing live gigs to support the first album and we had a our crew was coming back after the gig and got in a terrible accident where all the gear was destroyed and dana's beautiful yamaha recording series drum set that he had bought and used on the first album got totally destroyed in the in the in the accident so when we started you know doing demos for transcendence and making little home recordings um dana didn't even have a drum set to play so he could rehearse and get prepared to go in the studio to do the album and um he also at that time i think was having a lot of issues with tendonitis in his wrist oh yeah so uh warren our, our manager was working at the time on trying to get dana a new drum kit you know i think he eventually got dana a kit from pearl through some sort of an endorsement situation um you know because dana's kit that he lost in the accident was something he bought himself with hard-earned dollars and it was a very expensive kit and when when he lost it he wasn't prepared to just pre re replace that overnight um but eventually dana got another kit and it took him a little time to, you know, work out his tendonitis issues and get back into, you know, where he was uh, conditioned to play the drums and do like drums on transcendence. I think we ended up just programming a lot of the drums in the studio, but Dana was right there and like saying exactly how he wanted things, how he would play things. And Jim Morris had this amazing machine called a Synclavier at the time that just had world-class um, ability to make great drum sounds and tones. So between Jim and Dana and another guy at the studio, we they just they just programmed all these drums for transcendence in exactly the manner that Dana would have played them, you know. Yeah. And. And then we couldn't use like we decided we didn't want to use any of the drum drum sampled cymbals from the Synclavier or anything because the cymbals didn't sound real enough. So the cool thing is at Morris Sound, we set up all the cymbals in a room just the way Dana would have them set up around a drum kit. And Dana went in there and played all the cymbal work live. So on Transcendence, all the cymbals you hear on the record are real cymbals played by Dana's real hands. Well, all the drums you hear are actually programmed in a machine, but they were programmed from Dana's mind exactly how Dana would have played the drums. That's very interesting to hear that. Thanks for letting me know about that, Ben. Great album, like I said. But I mean, yeah. coming back to our Stromaker album, is there any favorite songs from that album you like? What's your favorite songs from that album? Astronomica. Um, going back to drums, I think the drums were programmed by John. I think John programmed the drums on a drum machine for that whole album. Right. There wasn't there wasn't even really a drummer involved with the band during the whole writing and creation of that record. It was the record was more created by John, Jeff, Wade, and a drum machine. Basically, there right. wasn't even there wasn't even a drummer involved in Astronomica, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> a drummer even helping to say maybe the drums should do this instead of that. I think John, I think John just programmed all the drums. It's kind but, of weird, um, kind of weird because like a has got a new band called Astronomica, and it's just the, the sound to Rock of Ages records. Yeah, he does. Um, Wade's actually using a real drummer on his record, really good drummer. Um, what do you What do you think of that band? Have you heard the single that he's put out? Yeah, I think they're they sound cool. They're very promising. You know, it's heavy. Uh, I, I'm good friends with Wade and his guitarist Rich, and they're great people. And you know. I think it's really good stuff. Um, they they have a whole lot of originals. I mean, they're like writing machines. They're writing a lot of stuff. It's really, really metal, a lot of cool riffs. So I think their record will probably be really good. I okay. Then. So, I mean, um, I mean, I mean that then the day, band, you guys, you guys broke up. What was the reason for you breaking up? Because you reformed, didn't you? 
Um, which time? I mean, we've I mean, broken I mean, up. You, 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 you did a reunion in 2005, and then another one in 2009, and this is when uh, you found Todd, who was now with Queensryche. Yeah. How did you hook up with Todd, and how did you, the reunion come around? Was it more of like the German audience or the Greek audience asking you to reform? How did it all come together, the reunion? Um, the reunion, uh, you know, after Astronomica, we sort of fell apart again, you know, right after the tour, for whatever reason. I don't want to go into too many details because yeah. there's, there, but the band parted ways again for a good five years after the Astronomica tour in 2000, and uh, nobody really talked to each other for probably five years, and then uh, in 2005 or so. We got back together and maybe did a couple shows with Wade again. And we're talking about maybe doing something again with Wade. And then all of a sudden, uh, a Greek promoter from the festival, the Rockway Festival, got a hold of us. And they were very interested in bringing over the original lineup for a festival sh appearance with, with Midnight. And they offered us a pretty good deal of money to do it. So uh, we did it. You know, we brought Midnight back in 2006, I believe, and um, went over and we 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 didn't do any new music that time around with Mid or do any recordings. But we rehearsed for s several months to go over and do one gig, you know, the Rockwave show and um, in Greece. And we went over and did that in 2006 with Midnight, you know, and uh, it didn't really go that well. From his standpoint, he was having a lot of troubles um, getting through the set, remembering lines and stuff like that. And it was kind of apparent to us that he probably wasn't in the, the best condition to be, you know, coming back to the band and trying to make a comeback, you know. So as much as we all love Midnight, we kind of thought, well, this probably isn't going to work after the Rockwave show. And um we uh, I think right after 2006 and that one show with Midnight, we we kind of reverted back to doing things with Wade again. And by 2008, maybe nine, we had, we had done another handful of shows with Wade. Um, some various gigs around Florida, California and stuff. So that's kind of how that went. And then Wade was back in again. And then uh after midnight passed away, unfortunately, you know, yeah, we were rest in peace. Yeah. Uh, course, my friend. We were also devastated from that. You know, our brother, our, our beloved friend, you know, was gone and it was a very hard time for all of us. And, um, we just had to, you know, pull together and try to carry on and as friends. And even if the band didn't, you know, we were, we were a little devastated. All of us, Dana was, Dana was devastated. Yeah, I can imagine. Sorry to hear that, man. So, I mean, you found T Todd Latore. I mean, what band was he before? After uh, Midnight passed, and we 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 were uh, we decided to do a tribute show to uh, Midnight at a big event that happens in Georgia every year called Prague Power. Oh, I know that one. Yeah, it's a great festival. Yeah, so we we did a gig at Prague Power to honor Midnight, to tribute Midnight, and we had uh. 17 or 18 different singers. You had one of my friends on stage, Nils from Pagan's Mad. Yeah, he was awesome. Yeah. You know, we'll never forget it. You know, that he came up to do that that night, the honor midnight. Um, uh, and all the guys that came up, you know, all the guys from the other bands that were playing that weekend came up and did like one song of Midnight's. Um, and all the guys uh that sang were pretty much from from well-known bands or metal bands that were on the scene or that were playing prog power and Wade was there and Wade did a few songs and kicked ass. The only guy that came out there and sang that night that nobody ever heard of saw before, never sang in a band before was Todd Latore. Todd, <laughs> Latore, Todd Latore came up to prog power and sang, sang a song. And um, somehow after that gig, I think we all had a feeling Todd Latore was going to be our next singer. I don't know. Something something was sparking between Todd and between the band. Um, before he, Even before the Prog Power gig, he came to our rehearsal room 
And um, a friend of ours named Matt Laporte introduced us to Todd. Matt Laporte was the guitar player for John Oliva's Pain. And uh, a good friend of ours um, and a, a really big Crimson Glory fan was Matt was, Matt Laporte. And Matt came um, and he was he was rehearsing with Crimson too to play some guitar with us at the Prog Power gig. He was going to play in the background, do some guitar work alongside John and I. And he brought Todd to our attention. He brought him to a Crimson Glory rehearsal and said, you should hear my friend Todd sing. So we let we ended up having Todd sing a song. But, you know, the connection we were having with Todd at the rehearsals, something told us, you know, maybe he was the singer that should be singing for Crimson Glory. And uh, nothing to take away from Wade because Wade's fantastic and he had his great, you know, contributions to the band as well but we brought in Todd and uh, it really worked out well he came in the band in 2010 and stayed till 2012 we had a couple really good years um, we did more touring with Todd than we did writing and recording you know <laughs> yeah I know now you played in you played in London on the I was going to go to that show but unfortunately Judas Priest were playing there me and Judas Priest are my favorite band I thought holy shit why do these two bands play at the same time so i had to make that wise decision but i'm so sorry i didn't see the show then i don't blame you choosing judas priest <laughs> <laughs> but i remember i mean i remember watching a video i've seen some videos of you live with todd on vocals i was like god they've got to make a record these guys yeah. are good but you never got a chance to do it did you um there was one song that was kind of a collaboration between john and todd where they did it in john, uh, todd's home studio it really wasn't a full band effort. It was almost like a, a demo that they put together as we were starting to think about new music for a new record. And the song was called Garden of Shadows. And they and they released that song as a Crimson Glory song. Uh, it's a pretty cool song. Again, um, I didn't have anything to do with it. Dana didn't have anything to do with it. Um, it I don't really think it's what I would call a Crimson Glory song. It was just kind of John and Todd collaboration in the very early phases of Todd coming into the band. Um, I think if we would have kept going with Todd and started writing an album, you know, a whole album with Todd and with everybody's contributing efforts, uh, we would have made a great album together. Oh, you know, absolutely. It would have been kick ass. No doubt about it. Todd's fantastically talented. You know, he did great with us on all of our our little live tours. We we took him on, and uh, he made a big splash and um, landed him a job in Queensryche, you know. And and his solo album is really good, really yeah, it's strong. Good. Yeah, it's very thrashy in places. He's a great guy. I'm really happy for him. He's kicking I mean, ass. Have you ever thought of, has Todd ever come back to you and said, hey, why don't Crimson Glory and Queensryche tour together? Yeah. Yeah, because I know Queen, Queen's Rake haven't played the UK Europe yet for this new album, so maybe uh, were you guys reforming? Maybe Queen's Rake and Crimson Glory should do Europe together. You know, maybe we'll see what happens. Actually, Queen's Rake is doing a tour. I think this coming May or April or May, in which they're they're going back and playing nothing but the first EP and the first album. Yeah, that's right. That? Yeah, yeah, they're playing the Maryland Death Death Metal Festival tell you a little secret about you know four, five six months ago when they were planning that tour you know to do and go back and do the very earliest queen's right material todd did reach out to me and he wanted to know if crimson glory had found a singer because he knew that jeff and dana and i were working on something and we were trying to bring the band back with a new singer and he said you know would you guys like to be the opening band on this tour um, April, May next year when we're going to go back and just do our first EP and first album only. And I said, man, I would love to. I think that would be so cool. But, but we, we haven't really finalized what's happening between us and a new singer right now. We're not really sure where we stand. You know, so I was very flattered that he asked and they wanted to have us on their tour, but uh, we weren't really ready to accept it. And they ended up, um, I think they got um, Armored Saint yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. For the tour, but but yeah, um, it was nice of Todd to reach out to me and and invite Crimson Glory to join them on a tour. 
I mean, look, you, you, no disrespect to Todd, you've got to look at this where if it wasn't for him joining your band, I guess he wouldn't have been in Queens, right? Yeah, maybe so. I mean, obviously he earned his position in there by being a badass singer, but maybe the fact that he was in Crimson and might have brought their attention to who he was. Yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, like I say, he's a great singer. He also plays drums, as we all know. So, I mean, we're going to move on now, Ben. We're going to talk about the new lineup. You've got Travis Willis on vocals. What band was he in before, and where did you find him? Um, Actually, his last name is pronounced Wills. Oh, uh, Wills, well, right, yeah. Um, he, he's from Dallas, Texas, and he plays sings in a band called Infidel Rising. I don't um, know them. Just tell me what they're like. How did you know what sort of style is it? Um, I think they might be a little in the style of like a Camelot. All right. Yeah, kind of that style. Yeah, I stayed um, at Tom's house from Camelot like 20 years ago in Florida. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw Thomas not too long ago too. Always okay. good to see. Um, I'm, I'm not really, really that familiar with all the songs of Travis's band, Infidel Rising, and what, you know, I've I've heard a few of the tracks. Of course, when we brought him into Crimson, I wanted to hear what he sounded like, and I listened to a couple of their songs. But I feel guilty that I haven't really listened to all of it or really delved in and checked it all out because because I'm just kind of so uh, wrapped up in my own world <laughs> of working and, and writing and working and worrying about Crimson and what our next move is going to be. Mm. But um, but 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 I know that Travis's band is really good. Um, they have an album out or or two maybe. Um, and it's really good stuff. It's, you know, it's progressive metal style stuff, kind of very innovative and not, not your average, you know, just rock and roll stuff, but kind of, kind of progressive like Crimson. That's interesting. Um, I mean, who else, who else did you approach for vocals for this, for the new, the, the current lineup? Um, well, actually, um, if you've heard of the guy named Mystique, who's, uh, who's made a couple of news news splashes about some music he's working on. He's a guy who sounds a lot like Midnight and just goes by the name Mystique. Um I don't know if you know anything about him, but he no. was brought to our he was brought to our attention a couple of years ago by a mutual friend. And and we talked to him for for a few months to going on a year or maybe a little more about the possibility of him being the new singer of Crimson Glory because he he has a fantastic range and he's an emotion the way he sings he's got the emotions in his voice like midnight did in fact he sounds even tonality almost identical to midnight um but for for a couple reasons i won't go into i guess things didn't really come to to a, a conclusion where we, we decided that he was going to be our singer or, or he wanted to be i wasn't i don't really know what happened but it didn't really fully it didn't come to be so right. after the Mystique thing, he did he did decide that he's going to do a solo record and just call it Mystique, and it's very much like a Crimson influence sounding record. Interesting. So uh, I wish him all the best. You'll probably be hearing about that eventually. Okay um, then. And, and so he's actually a singer that we did talk to, and we did work with, and we wrote with, wrote some songs with, and uh, we almost we almost made him the new singer, but it didn't work out. And uh, we wish him all the best. So um, after Mystique, um, I reached out to a friend of mine. Uh, well, he wasn't really a friend at the time, just a guy I had heard of, Mike Levis, who's a Greek singer and um, sings with a band called Silent Winter, I think, something like that. Or now he's got a new band called Blood Dorn. He's a very intense singer as well in a really good range, very you know, a lot of, a lot of aggression, you know, very cool. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's a, he's a young, maybe 30, mid thirties to early 30 year old Greek singer. And uh, Mike Levis is his name. Um, he came very close to getting the spot in Crimson Glory as well. And I think Mystique is also from Greece. So um, within the last couple of years, we almost hired two different singers from Greece, but that wow. didn't work out. <laughs> that didn't work. Um, I think the second guy, Mike, we were talking to, we just sort of realized 
he's a long way away and sending the ideas back and forth and trying to, you know, get him to track over there and send us ideas back. It was going to be maybe a little tough, just the long distance thing. Um, after Mike, uh, we, we, uh, somebody recommended to me that I check out this guy named Leo Unermark. I don't know if you've heard of him. No, I don't know. No. Um, he sings with a band out of LA. I'm trying to think of their name right now, but they're, they're really good. And he's really fantastic. He's a guy from Sweden. Um, let me prop him again. His name is Leo Unermark. Anybody check him out. He's really awesome. Um, we, we were talking with him, um, came really close to bringing him into Crimson Glory, but due to some scheduling between his other band and prior commitments he had and his distance of living in Sweden part-time and living in LA part-time, I, it just didn't seem like it was going to work out with Leo. So, uh, then, then comes Travis, uh, Jeff Lords, our bassist was friends with Travis on facebook and uh kind of kind of they kind of knew each other and had written each other a little bit and uh jeff knew travis was in a band out there and kind of a prog metal band so um you know after a few of these singers that crimson was looking at seriously didn't really pan out for us jeff knew we had to find somebody and he he suggested to us why don't we uh check out travis and give him a shot all right then, because I know Ben ja I, I know um John oh, God, sorry. Whoa, John Drennan left the band. I mean, he didn't come back because he had because he had some uh, issues with like family issues, didn't he? So you found a new guitarist, which was Mark Bog is it Bogmeyer? You yeah. know what what happened to jo John and why did you get um Mark in the band? Um to be honest, John sort of fell away from the band. Um, at the time when Todd was in the band, you know, 2012, Todd was in the band for about two years and we had done maybe four trips to Europe and some cool tours with Todd. And then we started seriously talking about, let's get busy to work on a new album. And Todd was very, very anxious to get this going. And we set a few, a few, uh, appointments at rehearsals to get together and let's try to write as a band and get this going. There was a couple of those that John made it to, and there was a few times John didn't make it, but the rest of the band did. Um, Todd was getting a little disappointed in John's non-attendance. And um, and then John just sort of pulled away and just never, never came back. I mean, he had a son right around that time and just really fell in love with the whole idea of being a father. And he never really said, I quit. Just um, He just sort of pulled himself out of the band you know, and sort of retired and, and, um, he just stopped coming. Let's put it that way. That's and, um, Todd, you know, Todd left the band really quick when John just stopped coming to the writing sessions and, and wasn't giving anybody any real reasons, you know, or explanation to what his plans were. He just, you know, kind of, kind of the way, uh, Scott Rockenfield left Queen, Queens, right? Yeah. John had a, John had a son sort of just disappeared and just no one ever heard from him again, you know? Yeah. Um, but Todd, Todd left, uh, left the band at that time because John's non-involvement and just fully joined Queensryche because when they first asked him to join Queensryche, he was considering trying to stay in Crimson and do the album we were talking about doing, maybe do both bands. Of course, I knew that wasn't going to work because once they really got rolling with him in Queensryche, they weren't going to let him be in two bands. You know, they wouldn't have said, OK, we'll share you with Crimson Glory. You know, yeah. if he was going to be he was going to be their singer. He had to be their singer and they would want it that way. Um, he he kind of had the idea maybe he would do both bands when they first approached him to be their singer. Um, but then when John stopped coming and doing, you know, his participation, it, it just made it real easy for Todd to decide that, okay, I'm going to leave Crimson Glory and just be in Queens, right? Right. And so about, about Mark, where did you find Mark briefly before we talk about this single? I've known Mark so many years. He's been playing with me and my solo project bands for, for 
a couple of decades. I don't know. I've I've made a few solo albums of different styles from, you know, heavy rock to heavy metal, prog metal. And Mark has been a part of a lot of those records I've made. Um, him and I have a good chemistry as a guitar duo and and uh even my band uh I call Avenging Benji, he's part of that band. And a couple of years ago, we went over to Europe and did a little Europe tour with Wade Black. And we did a bunch of Crimson Glory songs on the tour. And Mark was the other guitar player. So he's very familiar with playing all the Crimson Glory stuff. Um, we all go way back with Mark as a friend, um, Dana and Jeff as well. So it just seemed, um, I mean, it's been it's been about 12 years, man, since since the band was kind of laid to rest when Todd joined Queensryche and John sort of retired himself from the band, it's been 10 or 12 years now. So um, a couple times Dana and Jeff and I have said, do we ever want to bring this band back? Maybe, I don't know. Um, maybe if the right singer came along and really inspired us to do it, we would do it. And that's what happened with Mystique. When he came along, we were sort of inspired to do it again. Um, but we always kind of knew, I think Dana and Jeff and John, I mean, Dana and Jeff and I, since John pulled himself away, we always knew, I think if we were to bring this band back, Mark would be the other guitar player. Right. It's something I think we've known this for more than 10 years back. He would always be the guy. If it wasn't going to be John, Mark would be that guy. Right, so we're going to talk briefly because we're going to be running out of time again. So you've got a long, busy day. So tell me about the single briefly. How many, how many new songs have you got wrote, and what sort of reaction? What sort of reaction are you getting for the new single? The reaction is very good for the new single, man. Thank you. Um, we we tried to write something kind of in the style of of the old transcendent style, and and I came up with some riffs for this new song, the opening riffs, and said, "What do you guys think of this?" And they well, you sent them to me first, didn't you? It was a jingle. <laughs> that was kind of my little my first little demo I made of the song and gave to them Jeez. and said, what do, you, what do you think about it? They liked it. Um Jeff added a bunch of really cool parts and 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 pieces to the song to to make it not just an idea but a whole composition. So between Jeff and I, you know, we we created the music for the song. And Dane, of course, composed his own awesome drum parts and and Mark Borgmeyer did the solo on the song and created that. Um, Jeff and I wrote some lyrics for the song, but Travis actually wrote a few lines too and helped us fill in some of the blanks. So lyrically, it's kind of a combination from all of us. Uh, it was a real, it was a real team effort. I mean, it's not a song that just came from one of us, but it's a song that's uh, it's a result and it came from all of us. Right. So, has, it, has it been doing? Has it been getting an excellent reviews? Like response because I think it's brilliant. Thanks, man. It's it's been getting really good reviews. Everybody everybody seems to say they're really digging it. They're happy the band's back. They weren't expecting to see the band back, but but the song sounds just like Crimson Glory, just like they would hope it to sound. You know. I mean, you've got an album. You've got an album coming out very soon, haven't you? I wouldn't say very soon. Um. Our plan was to release two new singles right when we announced that the band's back on the scene. All right, we're back. We have two new singles. Here they are. So we, we did that. We made an announcement that we're back and we have two new singles that are already written, recorded, mastered, ready to ready for the world to hear. And we thought we would put these singles out, see what the reaction is, see if people are loving the new music, if they're loving the idea of a new album. If labels say to us, hey, we'd love to work with you. We thought then then we'll make a new album. But um, as soon as we put out the first single, everybody seems to automatically assume that we have an album done. Everybody's like, hey, can't wait to hear the new album. Send it over to me. I want to hear it now. I want to hear a preview. People are like, can't wait to hear the album. We're like, what album? You know, we just recorded two new singles. But, <laughs> but uh, honestly, with everybody's very positive response to the band returning and to the new music we have already been getting really busy on, on working on the rest of a whole new album uh, we have several songs in the works now and um, we're now we're very motivated to not just release two singles but to release a whole album oh. so um, everyone's just going to have to bear with us now for the next probably year or maybe 
you know, 10 months to a year while, while we do our work here, we got a lot of work to do and we're enjoying ourselves. Uh, Jeff and I and Dana and Travis and Borgie, we're going to be, you know, busy in the studio and busy composing songs so we can uh, give everybody the, the full album that they so seem to want. Well, I'd like to thank you, Ben, for doing this interview. I wish you all the best this year. Please do a new album. We all want to hear it. Do you have anything to say to the people watching this on YouTube? Um, hey, thanks for tuning in and uh, checking out the interview tonight. And I uh, wish you all well. And uh, please uh, continue to follow the band. And, um, you know, my best to everyone. Cheers. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ben. Keep in touch. I'm here for you if you need me. There's not many UK journalists that support this music, so... Thank you so much, Jason. It's a um, um, pleasure to be friends so long. Yeah, yeah, we'll have a drink sometime. As you know, I work with Anvil, so we'll, uh, if you need a drum tech, give me a shout. Let you know, we'll, I'll be in touch. Cheers, Ben. I'll be in touch and I'll send you this video, these interviews when they're online. All right, thank Cheers, you. Cheers, brother. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Cheers, Ben. Yeah.